I feel great. We can mutate the whole world into metal. Ugh. We can rust the world into the dust of the universe. Let's do it. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rolaine. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 135, back to Cole's choice. So, mushy mushy, what (laughs) did you choose for us? Well, you sort of gave it away. I chose Tetsuo the Iron Man from 1989, and it was written, produced, edited, and directed by Shinya Tsukamoto, who also stars in it. It also stars Tomoroo Toguchi, Kei Fujiwara, Nobu Kanaoka, Naomasa Musaka, and Rinji Ishibashi. And we would also be remiss if we didn't mention the indelible soundtrack work by Chu Ishikawa. It's about a metal fetishist who is driven mad by the maggots he finds wriggling in the wound he made in his leg to insert a metal rod. He runs out into the street and is run down by a salaryman and his girlfriend who then dispose of the corpse, hoping this whole thing will blow over. The salaryman, though, soon finds that he is now plagued by a curse that is turning his flesh into iron. So... How much of what I just described was how you read it at first blush? Were you picking up that much of the story, or was it just more about the overwhelming spectacle of that first viewing? If you could see me now, there would be question marks buzzing (laughs) around my head. Maybe also stink lines, because it's hot out here. But I missed quite a bit of that nuance or sort of connective tissue. No pun intended. So I think I really just approached this kind of as a lark, if nothing else. I went into it prepared for entertainment, prepared for a lightning bolt, and I got it. And in fact, I would prefer if when we come to those times where we describe the action, you take those, because most of my notes end in question marks on my paper. Okay, check. Huge drill penis bores through breakfast table. Got it. I got that part. (laughs) Well, this movie holds a special place in my heart and my movie-going history because it was the first major experimental thing that really made me say, what did I just watch? Because you've been telling me about this, I feel like, practically since day one. Yeah, it's huge for me. I saw this before I saw Eraserhead, before I saw Boonwell or Maya Darren or Stan Brakhage or Kenneth Anger, any of that stuff. We are talking about video store culture now. What age would you roughly put yourself at? 19 going into my early 20s was around this time. It all had to do with going to college, basically. The video store, though, that was my primary method of discovery back in those days. Like a lot of people, I'm sure, tons of our listeners can probably relate to that. It was still pre-internet, and where I was in Oklahoma, I didn't have as much access to the cutting-edge print resources. There was no film comment magazine in my world, for instance. And the film coverage in Rolling Stone or Spin, it wasn't necessarily voluminous or as devoted to the stuff that I was interested in as I might have wanted. So a good video store was a godsend. And where I went to college at Oklahoma State in Stillwater, our go-to place was Showbiz Video. We had a Hastings that also rented VHS, but they didn't have the variety or depth that Showbiz did. You could definitely feel the divide between corporate versus indie in terms of what they had in stock. Was it a similar thing for you? Did you have more of a mom and pop video store option or was your town more of a blockbuster kind of place? I think this is also where our age difference comes into play because once I was able to go on my own, we were pretty much in blockbuster territory primarily. The mom and pop stuff was gone at that point. When I was first starting my movie-going education in my teens, we had a great local one that my mom would take me to. And the cool thing that I got there were full-size posters from these movies I was watching, like The Grifters and Reversal of Fortune. But even the blockbuster times, though, I was like so many other folks just scanning through the shelves. Ooh, I've never heard of this. Oh, this cover looks interesting. 
oh, here's a recommendation, and just go for it. Take a chance. Well, what came with those indie shops, in addition to free posters, was curation and guidance, recommendations, that personal touch, and that experience that came from watching every tape in the store because you had nothing else to do. And those relationships with my local video store employees, they were crucial and very important to me. You spent a lot of time talking with those folks, or at least I did, and you learn their tastes and they learn yours and it's mutually beneficial. And that's how I found this. It was definitely one of those, you have to check this out situations. When I think back on that local one, it seemed like somebody's dad was running it as opposed to Quentin Tarantino being okay. employed there. So maybe not as many cutting edge recommendations or maybe who knows? I know I may not have been giving him enough credit. I certainly never had a conversation with him. I was, you know, 12 years old at the time. What were you even doing with your life back then if you weren't chatting up your Watching a reversal of fortune, evidently. <laughs> Well, putting that tape in the VCR, I distinctly remember such a great feeling of not knowing what to expect. And I mean completely. Other movies might have been a little strange, a nonlinear narrative, surreal in places. But this may be the very first time that I was thoroughly surprised by everything I was seeing at every turn. It's a little hard to convey now how this felt at the time, I think. There was a decidedly underground buzz to getting your hands on a copy that feeling that you belong to a secret club almost. And since you were watching Reversal of Fortune, I know you didn't see this back then, but how does it feel coming to it now? Viewing it in 2020, does it seem dated or like it might have lost any of its power to astound or confound? It was an utterly unforgettable experience. It doesn't seem dated at all to me, even though, as I say that, for some reason going in, I thought this was from the 60s before I realized, no, it's the 80s. I was thinking proto-punk instead of cyberpunk. So I wasn't thinking about as much of a digital thing as an analog and machinery thing. And yes, I was astounded and completely confounded. And I think that that would happen at any time period watching this. And I also think at any age. So it doesn't matter if you were 20 or 44 like I am now. This is about the fourth time I've seen it, I think, and so it's lost a little bit of that confounding potential because I understand it quite a bit more than I did the first time, obviously. I absolutely think this bears multiple repeat viewings, especially when I talk about those things like the connective tissue, when you realize, oh, this is what I'm looking at, and this is what the callback is to, and here's what the foreshadowing is. Even saying that, though, for me... It also belongs to a larger conversation regarding movies you might not be ready for. At 20 or so, and without a background in experimental film, this might be something you're not entirely equipped to process the same way you could 25 years later. I think the thing I had on my side at the time was that I was hungry for that sort of thing. I wanted these experiences, whether I was ready for them or not, and it was great for expanding my horizons. This film in particular gave me a lot of stuff to wrestle with and was quite possibly the very first thing that tested my ability to react first with inquisitiveness before anything else. Well, I think I've told this story elsewhere about renting Apartment Zero. I was about 10 years old, and this was based on a Siskel and Ebert recommendation. And that would have been all well and good, but I wanted to rent it for a family trip <laughs> to the beach with my aunt and uncle, and they still talk about the film. They mentioned it when we visited them. Do you recall this? Oh, I do, definitely. 30 years later. So let's just say they weren't ready for that, and I don't think they will ever be ready for that. I don't think I grasped it really at all, and I just realized that I didn't recognize any of the behaviors. It wasn't something that I saw in daily life, and I also remember thinking at the time, that's not a bad thing. That's interesting. Now I wish I had brought Tetsuo on the trip and blown their minds. Would that occur in the trip before or after you all go to the big chain restaurant where they can get the food that they are the most comfortable with that has no flavor whatsoever? That's every day. <laughs> yeah, you don't want me to tell you the story of watching my aunt pick garlic out of a potato dish? Yeah, it was really terrible. And that was only about five years ago. They're great, though. Do you remember me telling you that on our first date? I love them so much, but, but yeah ellipsis. Yeah, you had just gotten back from a vacation with them, and so it was definitely on your mind as we were first getting to know each other. 
Well, let's dive headfirst here into the world of Tetsuo. Let's do it. It's a world of scrap metal and hoses and fans and filters and grates. And maybe also cave paintings, it looked like. And pools of water dripping everywhere. Yeah, it is very much, just like the film, this fusion of ancient organic with the super modern cyberpunk future. And it's as much a ramshackle amalgam of genre, too. It's a little bit of a revenge film. There are obviously science fiction touches with the cyberpunk thing. It's a critique of Japanese culture at large. And some people at the time, they read it as an AIDS parable, which was not an unusual interpretation for body horror in that era. But most of all, it is a pretty relentless film with the body horror. I would say it falls into that genre as much as anything else. Absolutely. When we watch rebar being put into flesh and it's just the sounds coming from the guy. That's a huge thing. The way that sound and image work together in this. Just this first scene with the insertion of that rod into his leg, the maggots, the scraping of the rod against teeth. The combined effect of all of that is that it announces itself as something unlike you have ever seen or heard before. And it is a complete triumph of resourcefulness and ingenuity when you look at what they were able to scrap together. File that under labor of love and necessity being the mother of invention, essentially. This was a story that Tsukamoto felt that he had to tell, and this was the only way that he could afford to tell it. I admire that so much. It deserves every bit of its international cult status, I think. And I love it when all of those elements come together and a film like this especially finds its audience. It's so unique and was essentially willed into being. I enjoy when that sort of tenacity and dedicated lunacy is rewarded. And Tsukamoto could not possibly have guessed that this thing that he was making would influence so many other people into music. If you've seen a music video since 1989, it had to have come from being influenced by this film. So again, coming of age when I did, I feel like I watched it almost before I watched it. And it was also very literally the case that it connected with viewers in this visceral way. It was screened at this horror festival in Rome without subtitles even because Tsukamoto couldn't afford to have them added at that point. And it won the award for best film. Some things just transcend subtitles and communicate on a different level. You often talk about watching a movie without the sound. That's something you do regularly to get a different perspective or to pay closer attention to facial expressions and things like that. Sound is such a crucial element here, though. What about swapping something else out? Could you watch this and appreciate it without subtitles? I totally agree that sound here is practically a whole character or a whole world. But I love that this film also has so much in common with silent film. I think we talked about Boonwell earlier. So before you asked me this question, it hadn't occurred to me to watch this film that way, turning the sound off, because I like to do that so much with multiple viewings. I think it would be a fascinating exercise. I wonder, I have this idea, that possibly the biggest potential takeaway I would look for is the idea of what pain is involved here and how it's linked to pleasure for each character without those music cues. Would there be a different way of assessing sexuality as tied to technology? Without the subtitles, even though this isn't a dialogue-heavy film, I wonder if I would miss some key motivations, but maybe not. Because, again, if you think about silent film, you don't always need that information. Or you can make up your own. I think, ultimately, I prefer to have them as I want to get as much of what he's trying to communicate as I can. For instance, the final scene, which we did as our opening scene, there is some great comedy in that that you wouldn't get if you were just viewing it with no subtitles. I think you want that information there. But I can still definitely see you watching it without and it still being a vital and galvanizing experience, pun fully intended that time. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> and the significance of the timing of the release of it can't be overstated either. The way that it took that festival by storm was just the tip of the iceberg when you talk about its significance. The Japanese film industry at the time was really struggling. All of those classic studios that we know and love, and a lot of names that our listeners will be familiar with, Toho, Toei, Shochiku, Nikatsu, they were suffering, some teetering on bankruptcy. 
And Tetsuo occurred at just the right time to be a kind of revitalizing influence, raising Japan's profile again on the international scene. It wasn't the only thing that contributed to that, but it provided an undeniable and undeniably bizarre spark and drew a lot of eyes to Japan when they really needed it. Now, for such a singular experience, the creation of it obviously had to be pretty distinctive too, right? So we should probably address the grueling nature of this shoot. I mean, he had nothing, and he played all of those roles both in front of and behind the camera, sometimes out of necessity because the crew was kind of gradually walking away and filming in his own apartment. Yeah, that's the thing with a passion project like this. Unless you have a crew of diehards and true believers, for some of them, this is just going to be a job. Your second AD or your key grip might not be willing to live and die for this like the director would. And by the time they got to the end of this, like you say, it was pretty much just the actors left. Almost everyone else on the crew had given up on it, so the actors were the only ones left to perform those functions. And I think I turned to you at one point watching this and said, if you told me people were maimed during this production, (laughs) I would believe you. Hey, sometimes it's how it has to be. I look at Tsukamoto as a true artist, and that's what I find most valuable about him. He is completely uncompromising, still to this day, a true visionary. No one else would make what he makes. Given Tsukamoto's uncompromising stance and the idiosyncratic nature of everything he does, can you ever see him capitulating because some producer or a financier wanted him to alter something? I believe his friend, Takashi Miike, referred to him or still refers to him as a madman. (laughs) And keep in mind, this film took 18 months to make. That's a huge long time. I have read, though, that he's done other films as a hired director. He's also done voice and other acting work in other people's films. So he seems like he would be adaptable enough to get work not of his own creating, but with his own creations. I cannot imagine him capitulating to a vision other than his own. We're talking about writing, producing, directing, editing, acting, and then in your own space. Yeah, to me, he is the very definition of truly independent cinema. And the Takashi Miike quote that I like, the one that I think is even more illuminating regarding their relationship, he once said about him, I will never be able to beat this guy. And if you've ever seen Miike's Visitor Q, for example, you know what a significant statement that is. But back to the action of the film here. How would you characterize this hybrid world of organic and mechanical? Because from what occurs in the train station, it seems to be, at least in part, the result of a contagion. I think there are so many things interesting happening here that denote when they're in a state of quote-unquote normalcy, or that dance that happens that's sort of like a reaction as his body starts to change for the first time. By the way, the woman in the subway, she is my absolute favorite. And I was still wrestling at that point with who is affected versus what he is actually imagining is taking place. Because I wasn't totally clear. Is he being watched? Is this all a figment of his imagination? But I think that all of those different takes on it come down to that essential, still, organic nature to everything. Even when you're talking about compounds or alloys, there's still some sort of chemistry at the bottom of it, and we all seem to be made of atoms somehow. So it still seems to be something, whether it's created or thrust upon any of these characters, this sort of nightmarish world of, I can't quite put my finger on what is going on. Well, the organic part of it seems extremely important to me when I watch it too. You've got her manifesting this claw or sucker as almost a Lovecraftian appendage. And that's after interacting with what seems like a mechanical bird corpse. And everything that happens is born of human emotion. To me, it's all completely interwoven with cultural anxieties. The anxiety of not being in control of your body. The anxiety of technology taking us somewhere that we're not ready to go. The anxiety of suffering one of these episodes in public, or at least being watched, like you say. We see that when that Moshi Moshi phone call, it bleeds into the sex scene where they're being watched. And then as a flip side to them being observed, I really love in this scene where she looks into her little compact mirror and smiles during her transformation. She's watching her humanity depart, I think, and she seems to relish it. I want to talk about anxiety for just a second, because I think there's also, 
a section of the kind of broader definition of that word, and that's also eagerness. There could be an intense desire for this takeover. And the more you start to think about that, the takeover, the mutation, changing into something else, but it's still you in there, that is not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily, I think, that humanity is departing. It's becoming something else. Well, I think you make a great point, and I think it actually dovetails a little bit with what I find so exciting about this scene, too. This is one of my favorite scenes as well. How quickly she changes, that part shocks me a little. The whole scene is electric, and there are little things in it that I like. For instance, a bit of her appearance and makeup, it ties back to Japanese ghost stories a little bit. The ghost in the machine here, essentially. And I definitely feel the eroticism that Tsukamoto intended. I find her to be super sexy during this transformation process. I love how she's filmed everything about her performance. But I think a lot of my response is in league with exactly the thing that you are saying about eagerness. I think a lot of how I feel about this has to do with that smile that I mentioned. The way it seems like there's a part of her that is embracing this wildness and unpredictability and leaning into it. I think it also sets up a nice bit of compare and contrast too, because in comparison to how quickly she transforms in the train station, his evolution is more gradual and seems incredibly more painful. We find him assuming a position that is submissive to her, for instance, right after this. And there's a lot of give and take in every interaction in this film. It is a near constant exploration of exchange and all the associated dynamics with that. When there's a fight later, for instance, two characters feel the punishment that's being delivered to one. And there are multiple instances like this that are a commentary on how inextricable delivering and receiving pain are. This is an extremely visceral sadomasochistic film. And I think for viewers to get, quote unquote, this whole thing, I think they need to understand that these things on this spectrum are not inherently negative on their own. They're a part of a process and the film doesn't judge which is better, pleasure or pain, or even that they're separate. So when she has him on his knees, I don't think this should necessarily be read as a violation. Even in the most hyper-violent parts of their commingling, there seems to be an implied consent or trust between them, even if that's only apparent in retrospect. Maybe that's just me, though. How did it strike you? The exact same way. I was most excited by that crazy device coming out of her groin, and it seemed like they're both excited for the possibility. I think I'll probably continue to say as we go through this discussion that I didn't read an inherent badness to the transformation. I kept watching it and not thinking that this is such a terrible fate. Not, of course, that I want this for myself, but it didn't seem like that's what the movie was conveying to me. Again, this idea of eagerness or excitement as these not necessarily flip sides of these other more anxious emotions, but going hand in hand. Exactly. And then they symbolically reverse positions in what seems like his waking state. This is probably the most uncharted territory for a lot of new viewers to this, and I can see how it could be challenging. I don't know that I fully got it way back when. It requires the audience to reset their understanding of what is erotic, at least in the context of the film. The sensual endgame here isn't ultimately the conjugal bonding of man and woman, or even human to human, but it is of man and metal. If you're not ready to take on that idea, you might have to come back to this another time. But if you are comfortable with breakfast with a side of drill penis, then come on in. Honestly, I imagine this kind of thing going on all over Tokyo any given morning. And Germany. <laughs> but back to the drill penis. Yeah, even with that grinding its way through the table, the focus in this moment to me is still on humanity, human emotion and insecurity in particular. Because note how many times they speak some variation of don't leave me alone, even with all this supreme weirdness happening. There's don't leave me alone and there's don't leave me. And I want to offer another flip side. What if it's less loneliness and insecurity and more obsession might they say this to anyone that they've made a connection with or just to each other? Because she seems to be constantly indicating that she understands him or is willing to go to more lengths to keep understanding him, even with drill penis. 
I think there is definitely some element of obsession to it, but the majority of it I read as isolation and loneliness is the fate that is nearly unthinkable. I don't want to downplay the obsession part either though, now that I think about it, because of how tied this is to sex and how often sex brings out or highlights those most intense connections. Because it is still taking place even when it is dangerous and extremely ill-advised because he literally drills her to death during the act. Which I'm sure you could do a whole episode about just that scene on its own. But I think something that might get overlooked regarding that is the aftermath. The thing that I was focused on this time, this may be the benefit of having seen it multiple times and so that part's not so shocking anymore. I come back to how after he drills her to death, he covers her with flowers in the tub, almost like an Ophelia, it seems like. Is this something organic that he is adding to this process, do you think, to compensate for his becoming more mechanized? Some sort of an attempt to achieve or retain some balance or some semblance of his humanity? Because this is also after she's tried to burn him and stab him, so it still kind of feels like there's a partnership happening. And so remember, I'm watching this without my glasses. So <laughs> yeah, so it makes some of those small details a little harder to recognize. I wasn't sure if I was seeing flowers that were, to my mind, growing out of her in terms of her returning to the earth somehow, or if I was seeing something that was more along the lines of kind of a geode, a crystallized formation that's still natural, but this complex biological reaction. I didn't see it as something that he had done to or given to her, which could be a disconnect on my part. She didn't seem like the kind of character who would want flowers draped over her. Yeah, maybe. Because now that you say that, I'm thinking to the way that it manifested that claw in the train station. The female transformation does not involve nearly as much mechanization. It is organic material most of the time. So maybe it is just growing from her. And I also should clarify, I say he drills her to death, but that state hardly seems permanent for anyone here. This movie, it seems like it's constantly working on reconciling two extreme poles. You mentioned this just a second ago. Pain and pleasure, man and machine, life and death. And I say reconciling, but maybe not reconciling them exactly, as that implies a kind of coordination, but finding a way for the two states to exist in the same place simultaneously, regardless of the friction that it causes. Just a larger metaphor for the cognitive dissonance that comes when you're trying to contain two wildly disparate thoughts in the same brain. Realizing at some point that they're not so disparate sometimes, that's more of the bending your mind a little bit. Well, speaking of bending your mind, at this point, we're about halfway through the film. And as unlikely as it seems, it hasn't gotten truly crazy yet. So at this point... How lost did you feel? Were there points at which you felt like you had a handle on it? Any eureka moments? Did you feel like you knew what his aim was or even if he had one? He doesn't know what's happening to himself, so how could you? I felt pretty lost, but as we're coordinating through the action here, I'm not so far off in some of these places, so I think I was at least tracking along with you a bit. You mean you're realizing just now as we're having the conversation? That yes, Maybe I wasn't so incredibly off base. The thing that I love most about the visual style here, the thing that keeps me off balance, is that so much of the beginning, at least, through this first half, it involves never showing the whole of something and never at any sort of conventional angle. And really, you know, maybe I'm giving myself a pass, but I didn't feel like I had to get a handle on it. I was intent on watching it just as entertainment, first and foremost. I wanted to see what was going to happen next. And I still think that's a valid way to go because it's so visually and sonically stunning. There's so much to sink your teeth into without trying to parse if it's a comment on technology or sexual transformation or fetishism or none of the above. It's an easy thing to get swept up in, for sure, because of all the things that you see and hear. When he takes on his new form, with the assistance of this electrical outlet and all, it's pretty terrifying. It feels like we are seeing one of the great horror villains appearing before our eyes. We have no idea how he will evolve, if anything will kill him. 
the less than subtle symbolism of sticking any appendage into an outlet to feel something approaching sexual pleasure that adds another layer to the transformation. It creates magnetism, literally attraction. There's a lot of aggressive insertion here throughout the film. As with many monsters in cinema, we must confront what to do about this. If anything can be done, must he be destroyed? Can he be destroyed? Does this only end when he is too tired and he decides he no longer wants to go on? Now, I don't know what happens in the other films that came after this. You've watched them. Yes, but I don't want to spoil it for you. Great. Because I don't think of him as a villain. I wonder why that is. So I didn't think about his destruction or need for one. And I don't mean to skip ahead to the ending, but I kind of just assumed that he would succeed because there's so much metal out there. Or... If he is a communicable virus, no one stands a chance. And if we go back again to this thing that we've been talking about, the eagerness, the transformation not being a bad thing necessarily, it doesn't seem like there's implied villainy, at least to me. Uh, did you listen to our opening scene? I did. I felt great. <laughs> I mean, come on, take him at his word. I think any longer runtime may be too much to try to take in. But this story, it technically could go on forever. Like you say, there's so much metal out there. The scariest thing to me is that there is no final form. There's only constant assimilation and evolution. Which now makes me think also, is there an important distinction to be made between mutation and deterioration? If he becomes more machine than man, is he degraded somehow? And is it fair that I am asking you to define what it means to be human in 30 seconds on a podcast. Yeah, it's not. Thank you. End of story. Well, let's get to something that you have more expertise with, actually. Now, I say this understanding that there is only the barest thread of connection here, maybe, but you share a bit of common ground with Tsukamoto with your theater backgrounds. His film work was a direct outgrowth of his theater company. How different do you imagine that experience was from the experience that you had. Can you imagine seeing one of his productions? Yes, in capital letters. I've got a story for you that I think you above all people would especially appreciate. First, though, I'll tell you, in the early days of the theater that I worked in, we were super bare bones, and I discovered mice in trash cans many times, <laughs> and that was not a great experience. But So you weren't living as the Iron Man, but you were working in conditions similar to... It sure seemed like it. So this was when I lived in Baltimore and I worked in theater in the Baltimore and D.C. area, and there was a production of Kafka's Metamorphosis that seems like it would share kinship with this film. It was one actor, female, on sort of a scaffolding kind of monkey bar sort of set, and it looked massively kinetic and pretty cyberpunky. And it seems to me like the DIY aesthetic of this film would really translate well to the stage. I think it would have been a pretty electrifying experience to be in the audience. I don't know that experimental theater even seems like a broad enough term to take in what he's doing here, though. Is the experimental as much on the outside in the theater world as it is in the film world? That's a lot tougher for me to say because I don't have as much experience in the experimental side. I really only volunteered for a couple of productions and have been an audience member a few times. But really, if I think back to those people that I worked with or knew, it seems like they were going through the same struggles as everybody else was. They were the same kind of people. I would say probably the exception to that seems to be Steppenwolf folks from the early days. I can't imagine a John Malkovich that you would run across every single day. Well, in terms of other personal experience, does now having been to Japan inform how you view this or change how you might have thought of it before? I want to know your thoughts on this too, but it seems like when we watch this film, you recognize those alleys and those electrical lines. And so much of Tokyo looks like it's from some other world future. Everything goes up rather than out, at least to my mind. And it seems like it has this completely recognizable, differentiated urban topography. And it brought up for me that Tokyo seems like the perfect place for cyberpunk. I did read that Tsukamoto has a love-hate relationship with Tokyo. And so he was really looking to destroy it permanently, in a sense. 
For me in Tokyo, though, I just have a love relationship. Well, I saw this decades before we ever went to Japan, and all it did for me was bolster the impression that I must have had then that they were on some other level. People do lapse, I think, far too often and too easily into stereotyping Japanese culture, but I think in specific little pockets, it's certainly true. Not the culture as a whole, but very specific subcultures, Japan is willing to go much farther, much faster into weirdness than we are. And I love that about them. And we talk about Tokyo and how hypermodern it feels, both on screen and in real life. And I think you've answered this a little bit already. I definitely picture the cyberpunk possibilities and the futuristic vibe that we got from being there when I think about this now. The main difference for me with this film versus how I think of Tokyo at large is exactly what you brought up. I feel like I've seen more of the city, maybe only because of Tetsuo. And I am familiar with these less attractive parts of it, just somewhere in my soul. I've absorbed a little bit of that from watching this and several things like it, that Tokyo isn't all gleaming towers and flying cars. The main difference, though, I think for me is that real life Tokyo usually isn't relentlessly assaulting all of my senses at once in this way. I do definitely feel like Japan is ahead of the curve in so many ways. As one example, a lot of Japanese horror is very finely attuned to technology and is keyed into a fear of what that might bring. They were dealing with those themes in their genre cinema well before we were, and they have a much more thorough understanding of it, it seems to me. And then Tetsuo, it goes even beyond that to address this anxiety of what if I like what technology brings, but I can't find someone else who does. It's much more personal and idiosyncratic in that way, which is what makes it most effective to me. This feeling of, what if I am the only one like me? I think a lot of people feel that way about their sexuality, unfortunately. Maybe this can get them to embrace their inner Tetsuo. Because you've told me many times, if there's something that you're into... Somebody else out there is, and they've made a website about it. (laughs) And so I tend to think, maybe I'm not the only one like this, even if I make them from myself. Yeah, that generating from within, that is a really interesting point, actually. A piece of metal stuck in your brain. I love this metaphor as a way to describe a fetish. There's something buried in your brain, in your organic material, that's sort of a foreign object, but isn't necessarily dangerous by definition. It has the potential to be disruptive, but that isn't necessarily a foregone conclusion if you can control it and channel it properly. I love the way this film comments on all of that. And while we're still talking about Tokyo, another important aspect of this is something that might not occur to us at first glance. As enamored as we are of the city and our outsider tourist experience with Japan, This is a pretty withering critique of the day-to-day life for the salaryman. Working tedious jobs, making mind-numbing commutes, the lack of dignity and excitement in that, the way your will is subsumed by the larger machine. As visitors to the culture, it's not the first thing that comes to our minds because, like you say, I'm just like you. I have a love relationship with Tokyo. And we purposely spent a lot of time in nature. But I think it does take someone on the inside, like Tsukamoto, to become disgusted with that part of it and expose it to you. What it made me think of is my own love-hate relationship with where I live. There are so many things I love, so many things I hate and wish would stop. And I think people can relate to those same mind-numbing things and roles that are thrust upon you. Well, while we are talking about geography too here, I know that Tetsuo is about as far from the narrow margin as it gets, but in retrospect, I have a Chicago connection to a film again. Sonically, this time, it occurs to me that what was preparing me for Tetsuo back then was as much music as film. Very specific electric organic hybrids like Ministry and especially Big Black. Nine Inch Nails is probably the most obvious connection for the average music listener. You referenced music videos earlier. Trent Reznor had to have watched this movie a hundred times. Had to have. I thought about kind of some earlier Depeche Mode a little bit when I was hearing some rhythms. Were you much of an industrial kid when you were going through that phase? Did you listen to a lot of Neubauten or Front 242? Zero percent. I listened to Level 42. (laughs) Does that count? That's probably the closest I got. Well, Chicago 
was the American outpost for industrial music in the U.S. around this time. I didn't realize that. Yeah. As Discord Records is to capturing that specific Washington, D.C. sound, the Wax Tracks label is to Chicago. And buying those records absolutely paved the way for being able to connect with this movie on such a profound level. Those kinds of harsh, exaggerated sonics are so important to this movie. And I've heard the soundtrack described as unlistenable by some people. Did the sound design affect you that way? Was the music a struggle for you to get into? Well, categorizing something as unlistenable seems like it would be right up your alley. (laughs) Made for you. It's true. I favor noise. I can listen to Fugazi do 20 minutes of shaped feedback and be thoroughly pleased. You've often told me, this thing's supposed to be listened to loudly. (laughs) Well, I think of the soundtrack as having a smell and a taste Mm. and being tactile somehow. So it wasn't a struggle, really, but I probably wouldn't put this on the turntable, at least parts of it, to listen to without the film. I saw it described as bracing, which I think is great. Yeah, I don't think I'm your average radio listener so much. I think your musical tastes don't reach some of those noisier outposts, so how would you advise viewers that might be put off by it? Maybe it's just the mood that I'm in, but I would say, don't be a pussy, I guess. (laughs) Having said that, though, I can specifically remember times where, again, you have said, no, we're turning it up because that's how it's supposed to be listened to. Or you having to prepare me, for example, to see a racer head, that I was going to be feeling things in my brain that were uncomfortable. So I don't mean to make it sound like I'm some sort of really experienced, hardcore (laughs) listener at this point, but I think I was just in the mood to go with it. Well, I'm glad you bring up Eraserhead, because as long as we're talking about ways into the movie, when I look at antecedents, Eraserhead is an obvious touchstone. It has that high contrast photography and is completely bewildering in its own way. Something that I was thinking a lot about when considering that comparison is the last time I saw Eraserhead in a theater. And this was at Austin Film Society, with a theater full of people who are probably pretty used to the odd and off-putting. But the crowd was so restless. A lot of getting up and down, going out to the lobby and coming back. There was some quality to it that that particular audience found particularly uncomfortable. And it makes me think, I would love to see Tetsuo in the theater and see how an audience responds to that. And if you were running the sound, you'd put it up to 11. (laughs) And then as far as other influences, Jan Svankmeyer, his stop motion animation, that shows up a little bit here as well. David Cronenberg is probably the most obvious comparison to make here, though his work that is the most synchronous with Tetsuo was yet to come with Crash. Cronenberg's Crash made me feel very similar things in terms of eroticism and the direct connection with Grieva's bodily harm. But even considering Cronenberg, these are more atmospheric and surface comparisons than anything. It's a shorthand. It's a way for American audiences to get a foothold Because I think Tsukamoto, obviously, is far more experimental and harsh than any of them. He is certainly concerned far less, for example, with anything that could be considered straight narrative. I still do think newer viewers will find this surprisingly accessible once they give it a chance. And use whatever you need to use. That's all okay to use any of that stuff or something else as a way in. I encourage that wholeheartedly. Usually, I would describe it as baby steps to acclimate to a more avant-garde style, but I think this requires a little more extreme analogy. Acclimating to Tsukamoto is more akin to having that operation where they break your leg bones repeatedly and let them grow to meet each other, effectively stretching you so you can be taller. I would say just grab some spicy Doritos and (laughs) some Mountain Dew and just go for it. Well, we're at the end here. And obviously, I love this film. I've loved it for 30 years now. As a newcomer, how do you feel about it? Is this one that you would also recommend to people now? 100%. Like I said, an unforgettable experience. And I can't wait to come back because I want to see those things that I missed or just go off in a different direction, look for something new with the next viewing. Well, in the meantime, how about we go off in a different direction with your recommendation? Well, I picked Cronenberg, and I chose Dead Ringers from 1988, 
directed and co-written by David Cronenberg, and Sukimoto considers himself to be a disciple of Cronenberg, by the way. And this stars Jeremy Irons in a dual role and Jean-Vier Bougeot, and it's a somewhat fictionalized account of twin gynecologist Stuart and Cyril Marcus. The twins operate a fertility practice in Toronto, and the more confident twin seduces women who come into the clinic, and when he's tired of them, he passes them on to his shire brother, Beverly, unbeknownst to the women. So talk about something I was not ready to see at the time. I don't know if this was your experience as well, but in the early days of the E! Entertainment channel, they didn't have enough stuff to fill the kind of 24-hour cycle, so they would run the same promo ads over and over, and for whatever reason I was watching them, and this was one of them. And I remembered the colors and the instruments in this deep, deep sense of adult unease that was really unsettling to me as a teen. So of course I rented it when I got the chance. I'd like to come back to it now because I don't have so many strong memories of it beyond that unsettling feeling. And it's not from that supernatural or cyberpunky end of Cronenberg stuff, but it is incredibly grisly. I do remember that. And I think it would be great to watch with Crash as a double feature, you know, if I don't have anything to do for the rest of the month. Yeah, I distinctly remember my first viewing of this, too. This was one of those sitting in my living room floor at home late at night after everyone else had gone to bed and just being bowled over by it. And thinking about the union of man and metal, those devices, those instruments that he created for this film still stick in my head to this day. So how about your recommendation? My recommendation is 964 Pinocchio from 1991, directed by Shozen Fukui, and it stars Haji Suzuki, On-chan, Koji Atsuba, and Kyoko Hara. Basically answering the question, what do you do when you encounter something that you might not be ready for or that is pushing your boundaries? You keep right on pushing, basically. This is another bit of extreme cyberpunk madness about a memory-wiped sex slave cyborg who is tossed out by his owners because of his failure to be able to maintain an erection. You probably already thought that Tetsuo was turned up to 11, but 964 Pinocchio is like certain aspects of Tetsuo, then also turned up to 11. And I've said this before about other recommendations, but I don't know that I've ever quite meant it this much. This is not a film for everyone. It's basically a more concentrated treatment of some of the thematic threads in Tetsuo. The erotic issues are obviously the most amplified and front and center. But there's also a similar concentration on metamorphosis, though this one is more self-aware about that. It's not beyond your control or understanding the same way. It's also about 50% longer than Tetsuo, so your mileage may vary. If you think Tetsuo is perfect at 60-odd minutes, 90 minutes of this may be too much. But if you like Tetsuo and you're hungry for more madness in a similar vein, this is exactly what you are looking for. Vein. Get it? <laughs> <laughs> so once again, that's two great recommendations, Dead Ringers and 964 Pinocchio. And that brings us to the end of episode 135. First and foremost right here, we want to say a special thank you to Chris Palitza for becoming our newest Patreon supporter. We appreciate that very much. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new magic lantern in your life. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter, at Lantern underscore casts. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Laura Cannon at the Fatal Fims Podcast, Andy Wolverton, Meryl Onady, Mick Erdley, James Stoby, Leanne Kubich, Lee Sparks, and Brian Sauer. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcast, you can find us. Chris Polizza also left us a very nice rating and review on iTunes this time around in the U.S., as did The Flash Sawyer on iTunes UK. 
We are grateful to both of them for taking the time and trouble. If you'd like to leave a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material at the website, magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 